Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us. Welcome to today's Florida Pulse. You know, when the pandemic hit days two years ago, small businesses throughout the country and here in Florida were faced with challenges never seen before. Some were able to adapt and survive, some didn't. There is no question the pandemic has been a game changer for small businesses nationwide. There's been a long list of challenges from the mass mandates to the supply chain disruptions. But you know what? There's been a positive as well. It's led to innovation that's been necessary to survive. I'm Marsha Pledger. I am the editorial and engagement editor at the Florida Times Union. I am also among editorial page editors throughout the USA Today Network of Florida. Um, the last for the last two years, these editors have been um, talking about just diving into all sorts of subjects. And so each month, a new an opinion editor chooses a different subject to dive into. And I chose small business because that's my passion. It's the reason mm -hmm. I started a new rebound series here in Jacksonville that checks with small business owners every month just to see how they're doing. You know, how I want to know how they've been dealing with these ups and downs of this pandemic. <laughs> Um, and so, and you know, what I found out is depending on the industry, some industries uh, have, have suffered more than others. And then some industries like landscaping and logistics have actually prospered. So, you know, I'm excited to say that we are very fortunate to have some great panelists today to talk about what's going on. Um, and they're from all over Florida and they include everybody from, um, an organization to help small businesses. They, I got a business editor uh, here. I got a business owner and another business owner and an author here um, that focuses on women small business owners. But I'm going to let them introduce themselves. So let's get started. How about we start with Houston? Did right, you introduce thanks, yourself? Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. And thank you so much for uh, for inviting me to join you today. My name is Houston Pullen. I'm the <laughs> director of the Small Business Development Center at the University of North Florida here in Jacksonville. We cover 18 counties um, around Jacksonville and North, uh, Northeast Florida. Uh, and our program is the uh, SBDC has been around since 1976. And it's a cooperative agreement between the US Small Business Administration and the university system here in Florida with UWF being the headquarters for the state. But we also are very fortunate that the state of Florida is also a, a funding partners, a partner of ours, along with several other um, local agencies, such as um, city of Jacksonville and some of the um, outlying counties such as St. John's County, Nassau County, and Putnam County. Uh, we have quite a few folks who have uh, who help uh, support what we do. And our program is you know, <clears throat> fantastic for being able to support small businesses throughout the state. So that's uh, a little bit about what we do, but we'll get more into that, I'm sure, as we go throughout the day. Thank you. Let's go to Nancy. Hey, Nancy, thanks for joining us. It's Hello. Yeah, thank thank you for for having me. I'm I'm excited to be on this very very important program and to share some some really a great insight and to learn from the other panelists. So I am Nancy Allen. I'm president and CEO of the Women's Business Development Council of Florida. Uh, we certify, we connect, and we champion women in business. We certify women in business through an affiliation we have with a national organization called the Women's Business Enterprise National Council. And through that affiliation, we uh, certify women to prove that they own, operate, manage, and independently control 51% of their businesses. And through certification, they are able to access corporate and federal contracts. So I'm excited to share good news about what's going on with women in business around, around the state. Thanks so much. Hey, Suze, thanks for uh, participating in my Rebound series, and thanks for joining us today. Please introduce yourself. Well, thanks for the invite, Marsha. It's always a good time when me and you link up and discuss business. First off, I like your passion. I love your passion for small business. Um, hey, Sue's Garay, uh, originally born in the Bronx, New York, was raised in Jacksonville, Florida. I am retired United States Army at 20 years, and I am the owner of Global Freight and Commerce. We are a full service trucking company with 18 trucks all over the United States uh, of America right now. Thank you, thank you. Dave, a colleague, Dave, let's please introduce yourself. Yes, I'm Dave Berman. I'm the business editor at Florida Today, and we're based in Melbourne on Florida's Space Coast. 
And um, our area includes Kenny Space Center and Patrick Space Force Base, as well as some major employers like um, high tech companies like Harris and Northrop Grumman. And it's also a major <laughs> tourism region on the Space Coast where um, we have 72 miles of beaches. So it's a big um, draw for visitors to the area. And we're excited to um, be part of this forum today. Nice, nice. Love the beaches. <laughs> so let's get going. Thank you so much, uh, all of you guys. Again, let's start with um, a business owner. Hey, Seuss, you know, I want to know what did the pandemic <laughs> teach you about yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, uh, this is the I, I'll tell people, be careful when you ask me a question, because I'll tell you the truth. This is the one question I have to be careful when I answer, because if you don't know me, you may take it some kind of way. Oh, but no. the pandemic taught me that I am who I thought I was, right? You don't spend uh -huh. your entire life training and preparing yourself not to get in the game. And once you get in the game, you want to be tested to your full or your maximum capacity. And I was tested and I am still here, and despite being relatively new to the industry. I've only had this company six years. Okay. Uh, we just hit uh, close to six million in revenue. We're actually gonna double that, or close to double it this year. Um, nice. And the pandemic was the best thing that happened to us. But when people ask me, what did the pandemic teach you about yourself? I, it, I say, it, I am who I thought I was, right? And until you are tested, until you are punched in the face, you oh, really shoot. don't know if who you are. Oh shoot! Okay, that 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 gets it going. That's for sure. Well, on that <laughs> note, uh, I'm gonna bring uh, Nancy into that. You know, related to struggles and punched in the gut. Uh, what have you seen, and what can we learn from the women that work that you deal with? Yes. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, some of the obvious things that, that, that we saw is the importance of uh, recalibrating work life balance. Right. So, so many people had to leave their their place of employment where they had their own desk and their own office or cubicle and start working from home along with their kids and the cat and the dog and the you know the 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 school that's going on through Zoom and all of that. So I think that that there were uh, there was a, a period of adjustment. Um, I think also what happened with a lot of women is that they saw the pandemic and the, um, you know, going home and having time to think and dream and, um, you know, really consider what's important in life. Um, a lot of women decided that it's, it's really the right time to start their own business. So we did see a lot of um, interest in business development programs and certification. Um, and last but not least, I think we, we all found new ways um, to deal with stress. So, you know, look at, at what happened with, um, you know, at home exercise gyms and, and, and machines and then um, home improvement. A lot of people taking time to go out and, and, and do some home improvement that they have been putting, putting aside. So I think that along with the angst, uh, there were some people who were really able to say, OK, this is a, a good time for me to pause. Let me reassess and um, let me decide how I want to move forward. Thanks so much. That 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 uh that's great. <clears throat> On that note, let me bring Houston in. Um, because you deal with all sorts of small businesses and all sorts of industries. So I want to ask you, did you notice that there was one particular industry that was um affected more than others, or you know, certain industries that were affected more than others? What did you notice? Yeah, no. Um I, and that's a great question. I there were so I, I mean, this is this pandemic affected businesses in so many different ways across a variety of different industries, a variety of different um, uh, types of businesses. You have a lot of in-person businesses; those got affected, you know, probably um, probably more so than others. And a lot of the supply chain type of businesses, logistics type businesses, also got impacted. But you got to look at like the restaurants, right? So you have a lot of restaurants that have been impacted, as well as a lot of retail businesses, uh, especially those retail businesses that are. You know, face to face, they had to innovate, like you said earlier, and adapt mm -hmm. to this new world, this new way of uh, conducting business. And in order to do that, they had to really understand where they were going to go. And it forced a lot of folks who were, you know, one way of thinking, one way of doing things 
you know, there, a lot of businesses, hundred year old businesses had to find a new way to innovate very, very quickly. A lot of these mom and pop shops, a lot of, you know, startups who thought they were going to go one way now had to go another. And that's where, you know, you see a lot of these ideas that have started to generate. And as you said earlier, a lot of businesses were impacted ne very negatively, because. Mm -hmm. but at the same time, it also did force a lot of innovation. There's so many stories that I've heard and even that I've seen since coming here to Florida as the director of the Small Business Development <laughs> Center that I think could really, you know, be inspiring for folks who are who are still reeling from the effects of the pandemic but those who are looking to actually start post pandemic i think that there's some there's some great things that they would be able to uh, learn from those stories thanks that helps a lot i want to bring dave into the conversation hey dave um hey. i want to know in your tourism world um you know one, one thing i've noticed just in the short time I've been doing this rebound series is that everybody's been um, dealing with worker shortages. So has how has the worker shortage been going on, including the low unemployment rate affecting small businesses in your world, like, you know, retailers, restaurants? Can you comment on that? Right. Um, it's been a pretty big impact on local um, service businesses, as you mentioned. Um, like, for example, in, in our county, the unemployment rate is less than 3% currently in almost half the counties of Florida have a rate of 3% or less, which is um, considered full employment. So um, it's a good thing for people looking for work because they can um, have a good selection of jobs to find. But the problem is for the um, employers, like especially restaurants and retail stores and hotels, they're having real difficulty filling job openings because employees are getting more selective. Yeah. Like they have a lot of out um opportunities out there and some businesses like restaurants for example in our area and also throughout the state are having to cut back their hours or not open seven days a week anymore so they might close on monday or tuesday for example or sunday and monday so um just because they don't have the servers and cooks to handle the, the um workload seven days a week so wow. it's been it's been a real challenge for a lot of service businesses to to um, keep their um, levels of employment up in, in um, these times. Thanks. That helps a lot. Um, you know, on that note, I'm going to bring um, ask Houston about that, you know, because, you know, all these small businesses were struggling and, and it was really disheartening to see, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, when the government was helping so many big major companies, but not the small businesses and small business owners didn't know how to access government funds. You know, um, and so I want to ask you, how did your organization support the small business community during this difficult time? Absolutely. And that's a fantastic question as well. Um, you know, one of the one of the big things with the Small Business Development Center and I, I, I worked in a small business development center previously to being the director here um, okay. a couple of years ago in Nevada. And okay. The SBDC program is a fantastic program that is designed specifically to support small businesses, whether you're looking to start a business, whether you are looking to grow your business, exit a business, or save your business, right, during the pandemic. I, I think that this is a great case study of, especially here in Florida, the SBDC program has done a fantastic job during the pandemic of really helping small businesses to, to really stay alive to stay going and i can give you some very specific examples the state of florida has a bridge loan program for small businesses that the sbdc is a primary administrator for to be able to help with um putting in those loan applications and processing them and helping those small businesses survive we had a number of bridge loans that we supported throughout the entire state there are nine regions to the sbdc program i i, I have um uh, the UNF region, but there are nine other regions and all of them, every single consultant, every single region worked diligently to make sure that those bridge loans were processed and worked with the state to try and make sure that those things were done for clients. And, you know, that's no easy task, especially when you have all of a sudden this major catastrophe and all of these small businesses are coming to try and get support. I mean, really, it, it's incredible what the teams have been able to do. Um, SBD teams across the state have been able to do to help with that. In addition, you know, SBA, there was guidance with SBA state and local relief funding that we were able to work with, such as the CARES Act. CARES Act was able to provide some support for us to be able to provide more support and capacity to help small businesses with um, our no cost <clears throat> consulting, because our program is designed where we don't charge for the services that we provide. 
um, especially in our signature that we do is our no cost consulting where we'll meet one on one with businesses and work with <coughs> them on any on any business matter that they need assistance with. So we were able to expand that and we're very grateful to our our uh, funders, SBA and our state and local partners who were able to help us with not just increasing our capacity to be able to support small businesses, but also finding other ways to be able to invest in small businesses during this time. You look at the idle loans that SBA had provided. You look at all of those relief funding measures that um, the government was able to put together. It was, and of course, it's not easy when you're putting all these things together for the entire country in a very short amount of time. But we're very, very grateful that we were able to have those kinds of tools to be able to support our small business clients here in Florida. And in addition to the things that you know we did on those fronts, we also worked with uh, the city and county go uh, governments in rolling out and promoting local stimulus opportunities for small businesses. Because a lot of um, the local, uh, the state and local entities, they were able to develop and pull funding together that they were able to help invest as well. So it's not just federal and state, but you also have the counties, you have the cities, you have the townships that were able to jump in and find ways to support their the small businesses within their own communities. And our and what I'm so grateful and what I am so just, I admire my team so much for everything that they've been able to do as well. Cause I came in here in uh, January, 2021, the pandemic was already going. And in 2020, yeah. just looking back at what they did in 2020, what they did in the last year or so that I've been here, they've just done a tremendous job of working and building those relationships, not just with our partners, and those um, those organizations, but also with the small businesses that have received the funding to make sure that it's not just about receiving the funding, but how do you innovate? How do you maintain growing and moving yeah. forward in a new in a new way of doing business? So I think that there's a lot of great things that we've been able to do. Thank you so much. That that's helpful. I, I want to bring Hey Susan to that um, topic uh, because as a business owner, you know, and I've and I've talked to a lot of business owners and. A lot of people were just lost, though, in the beginning. And, then, and one thing, you know, and before before I ask you a question, I want to say that, um, you know, I had a column for 10 years called My Biggest Mistake and How I Fixed It. And when I was in, in Cleveland and, um, you know, one of the things that long before a pandemic, but the fact is we've had other challenges in life. We've had recessions. We've had challenges, you know, and so too often small business owners were afraid to ask for help or didn't know where to, to even start because, you know, <clears throat> Houston just gave all, all this great information, but a lot of times people don't even know where to go. So please tell me, Jesus, what in, in your experience, when the pandemic hit, where did you turn for help? Then did you get a PPL loan or, you know, tell me any, you know, what happened? Uh, <laughs> all right. So I, uh, one of the things that I do is, is I've done it for a long time and it helped when the pandemic hit, but I didn't do mm -hmm. it in case of a pandemic. Uh, but I, it now showed everybody why you have to do this. So I often tell people politics drives business, drives politics. It's kind of a yin and a yang, and I draw this circle. Mm -hmm. And if you're in business, you're in politics. And if you're in politics, you're in business. You don't get a choice. Uh, every business owner needs to know at a minimum your local reps, state reps, your congressmen, your city council people, you need to pay them regular visits. You need to help them. You need to request help from them. You need to be at me meetings. Uh, I happen to be very, very politically involved and in, um, all the way up to the federal level. Okay. So I'll tell you how it paid off. Um, yeah. So when we got hit, uh, so one, one of the things, I was in the army for 20 years. I was all over the world, five times to Iraq. I spent five years in Korea, spent a year in Bosnia. The rest of the world has pandemics all the time. This is America that, that is relatively inoculated. So I was dragging my staff through things 30 days prior to America kind of getting ready. I was beta testing systems, this whole Zoom thing we're doing. No one was doing Zoom at the time. We were already, I was kicking people out of the office. We were doing all this stuff. And even my general manager at the time was looking at me kind of weird. Like, this dude's a doomsday prepper. What's wrong with him? And um, so we were working from home three, three and a half weeks prior to March 14th, this is kind of a big date because March 14th was the first day Lenny Curry ever had actually had a meet or a press conference for the city of Jacksonville. We were already working from home. And so cut to the chase, that's kind of when I when everybody started being like, wow, what is what is this guy Jesus know? Why why is he why is he so far ahead of us on this whole pandemic deal? Well, I had saw this stuff happen in all of all the other countries. Uh, not this specific one, but stuff like this. Okay. Um, so, uh, so I prepared my staff, right? 
Um, so what, one, what, well, as a small business, a small business owner, 100% owner, self-financed, I'm happy to be in one of those industries that banking just doesn't like. I'm also a real estate investor primarily. Right. And I was an investor. I was an investor prior to 08 and prior to Dodd-Frank. And I hope that's not kind of, I hope this audience can kind of understand what that is. So prior to 08, when we had the financial crash, everybody was getting home loans. They were just lending money to anybody. I remember a friend of mine yeah. who was working literally two weeks at Dunkin' Donuts, who a, a friend of mine that I knew who was working for, had I literally had a job for two weeks, got a home loan for $125,000. And I was like, that's kind of, that doesn't make any sense. And I was an investor at the time. I was like, that doesn't make any sense. And this is what happened with all those loans and uh, that went bad. And they were literally had, they were betting and hedging against those type of loans going bad, which is what happened when we had credit default swaps, which led us to the downturn. But we had actually, and I'm a business owner and I'm a pro free market guy. We had yeah. probably the best piece of legislation, which was Dodd-Frank, that made it harder to lend. And now I'm actually on the downside of that because transportation is one of those industries that you can't hardly get any money out of the banks. All right. Mm -hmm. So which makes which here's the 10 year um, effect of that. I don't have a good banking relationship to this day. I just don't have a good banking relationship. They don't like to lend for transportation. And so there's really no need for me to have a good banking relationship. I have a good pri private equity relationship. But I don't have a good yeah. banking relationship. So what happened with the pandemic? The pandemic hit and small and minority owned businesses got less than 2% of the first iteration of PPP. Meanwhile, pe people like the LA Lakers got $5 million. All right. I happen to have a personal relationship with Congressman Rutherford. <laughs> okay. And I actually was on, I was, I was called into a meeting and I had to show them in addition to just small and disadvantaged businesses and women owned businesses, all of the people that don't have really good banking relationships. We don't have 20 year relationships with banking presidents and all that. I had to show them how a lot of your small businesses don't have the leverage to have a bunch of W two part uh, relationships. We have to do these strategic partnerships with other people that provide us services in order to get the same thing accomplished. And we don't have the same command and control over those people, but they, but we still pay them. So that, so, but the way they wrote the language in PPP version one, we didn't qualify because it was all W2. So I actually hmm. wrote a white paper and, and gave a class to a few Congress people and a few local reps, but a few Congress people. And they actually took that back to Congress. And, and, and Congressman Rutherford actually came back to my office recently and told my whole staff and told a bunch of people, hey, Jesus is actually the one that showed us that and gave us a white paper. And we took it back and everybody was like, oh, okay. And when they opened it up, PPP version two, the floodgates opened for small businesses. I'm not saying I did it, but I was definitely yeah. a contributor by having existing relationships with uh, Congress uh, congresspersons, city council persons, and uh, and politicians. So 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 there was a prime example on why if you're in business, you're in politics, and you need to be involved or you need to have relationships with the people who craft legislation who may not have ever owned a business. A lot of the reasons why it's hard for me to have relationships with like SBA folks and all the people that are supposed to be the subject matter experts is because they actually never owned a business. And okay. they may not act they may not actually have the same level of passion that I have behind the sinking, drowning weightlessness of having to make payroll, which I just wow. cracked 300 weeks in a row. That's wow. something we celebrate as a business owner, right? Know, Without right. missing one. Yeah. Um, That's and so it, yeah, that that right there is really hard to swallow when I'm having to get my information from someone who never owned a business. I understand maybe a subject matter expert, but everything is expedited when it comes to us because we got to make payroll. So the lesson of all of this is how did I do it? Um, I was able to help others. So one, one of the things I did, I'm actually a general contractor. I actually didn't pay myself for nine months during PP, uh, during uh, COVID yeah. because I didn't want to let anybody go. I had a couple of young girls with me at the time. This was prior to anybody getting um, yeah. PPP, prior to anybody. The, uh, Trump hadn't cut any checks yet, which I think we yeah. needed to get a few. I think we got a couple too many, but we needed to get a few. And the market was kind of, it was looking kind of, kind of reckless for a few people. And I didn't want to let these young girls go out to the market because I didn't know what they were going to do. I went out and started doing all kinds of stuff. I was doing roofing. We were doing roofing and construction. I was doing all because I'm, uh, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. And I ended up, you know, taking care of myself for, for nine months and not taking a paycheck from my own company while feeding everybody in my company while revenues plummeted almost 90%. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That, that, wow. That's that. I really appreciate you sharing all that. Um, before I, I, I go back to um, Nancy and Dave and Houston, I want to 
ask you one quick question, um, just because of, on that note of all the struggles, uh, which is, you know, the elevated gas prices. I want to just, if you can just touch on that, um, you know, because you're in shipping and, you know, how it, might, it has to be hurting your business as well. Uh, and, and maybe there's some, you know, need to be putting pressure on the Santas to loosen these gas taxes. I don't know. But, you know, if you can uh, have it. No, not gas really. If, okay. if, so we also have something. So we also have, so, uh, yeah, yeah. So gas prices are up a little bit, but so are rates. Okay. Um, and we also have, it's, you're going to have maybe a little less of a margin, but, mm -hmm. marg uh, but our rates per mile are kind of historically high right now. We're at 350, okay. 351. Okay. And also there is every Monday, there's something released called a fuel surcharge okay. that the, the brokers are allotted, excuse me, that they have to award the carriers, which is what I am in that's built into the rates. Uh -huh. And we've seen those jump to kind of offset what the gas prices have been. So, so it's not like we're the only ones that share the jump in the rates. The brokers have had to do it, the shippers and the customers. So this has been spread amongst America and it's not yeah. like they just flick that or they just, we're the only ones that do that. Everybody okay. has shared it. And so we definitely see it in our weekly fuel bill, but yeah. we haven't seen it directly hit our bottom line as if we can't turn a profit or we're not in the black. We're good. Okay. We're still good. All right, great. Nancy, um, you know, there's been, uh, I want to talk about innovation because, you know, the one thing, one reason I wanted to start my rebound series is because while every um, industry and everybody has been affected by the pandemic in different ways, the fact is um, whether people wanted to do it or not, they tried things that they never would have tried otherwise had it not had they not been forced because of the pandemic. So I want to ask you um, about innovation and what you've seen from some of the women business owners that you work with. Mm -hmm. So I, I think early days, um, the the people who were the most successful in in handling the stress of the the pandemic are those people who just kind of took a step back and said, okay. Um, I have this as a mission or I have that as a vision um, and I was doing it this way and okay. now I need to rethink. Right. So um, there's a podcaster I follow who who has a quote that says, be committed to the vision, but not attached to how you get there. Mm -hmm. And people think that commitment and attachment are the same, you know, two sides of the same coin. but They're actually quite different. Right. So. Um, I'll share a couple of stories, success stories from, from the, the, the women that are certified with us. Uh, one um, partic in particular was a, um, an event planner. Mm -hmm. And her business model was planning local and national events here in the U.S., here in Florida. And they were in-person events. Um, she had a rather large staff of people who, who did everything from the, the pre-planning to actually being at the event to the post-event. Post um, activities. And all of a sudden, all her contracts got shut down because mm -hmm. of the, the lockdown. Right. And so she um, took a look at her, her experience, her talent. And she said, you know what, we could probably do this via uh, the internet. Right. And so she was one of the, the, the very first early adapters to the Zoom and, and other platforms. Um, and turning the clients that she had who had ended the in-person contracts to say, we can put on an event for you um, virtually. And uh, because of the contacts that she had and the technology and, and all of this, she was able to, to do that very successfully. And one thing that, that she uh, got to do that had not been part of her vision was to um, establish her business globally because now she wasn't constrained by travel. Um, you know, prior it, it used to be, it was too expensive for her to go out of the country to do these events. Now doing them virtually, she's a global company. Okay. And, um, I think that's a really good example of how you can, you know, readjust, right? Another right. company um, was okay. in the, the uh, training and, and uh, equipment space, right? Okay. So uh, she was, uh, you know, uh, designing gyms in large corporations and, you know, maintaining the, the, the equipment um, and providing trainers. Well, when everybody started going home, you know, what could she do? She decided also to embrace technology. 
right? And to do virtual training. And okay. they came up with all kinds of uh, programs where they were giving incentives to people stuck at home to do some exercise via the internet, right? Via Zoom. Yeah. And her business also went global from, from mm. uh, this opportunity of the no boundaries that, that the, the technology offers. So I, I think uh, really, um, you know, that statement, be committed to the, to the vision, but not, how, not attached to how you get there, really serves us well when um, things don't go according to plan, right? We can all, right. It. there's always a, a way to, to take a, back, a step back and say, okay, how can I provide XYZ service that I am really good at to now this new audience? Perfect. Thanks so much. Um, love to hear that optimism. And, um, you know, I want to just take a minute and anybody can answer this question because I got a question from um, Phil uh, Fernandez. He's a growth development reporter at the Naples Daily News. And he just asked, uh, he said, companies certainly struggled early in the pandemic, but now with the worker shortage, how does the current situation compare to that period when businesses closed permanently? And what's the outlook? Anybody can take that. I, I can um, address that a little bit. Um, sure. I know the um, state's chief um, labor economist had a briefing last week to discuss the outlook for the job market. And she said that um, in the next two years, they, ex they expect to um, have a pretty steady increase in the number of available jobs. So um, this um, bodes well for um, optimism for the um, employers and for the employees where there's going to be more job opportunities available and um, there'll be um, increasing um, openings. Currently, there's more job openings advertised than there are people who are employed. And this is like uh, by about 200,000 more jobs advertised last month than there were people um, who were looking for work but didn't have a job. So. I think the outlook now looks pretty positive compared to um, maybe the start of the pandemic where employers were cutting back and some employers had to shut down entirely. And um, several months ago, the number of jobs that were gained since um, the middle of 2020 exceeded the number of jobs that were lost during the start of the pandemic from February to April 2020. So all the jobs that were lost have been um, regained, and now there's um, more jobs anticipated for the coming two years for openings. And this is a, a whole variety of industries from high tech to retailing where the jobs will be available in the coming two years. Thanks so much. Um, Houston, I want you to weigh in on that, uh, you know, just, you know, piggybacking on this and following through. But I'm, you know, I was wondering what kind of advice are you giving to your clients? And before you answer that, the reason I'm asking that is because just in the short time I've been doing this rebound series, so many industries have been impacted differently. What and I've only been doing a few months and I've just been asking people, what's up? How you doing? What's going on in your world? And the first several, quite frankly, were hit way harder because you know, based on the industries they were in. And then someone like a landscaping company, you know, one particular person I interviewed, he went from 50 to 100 employees in two years. What the heck? You know, <laughs> it didn't say, you know, so it sounds all good, right? They said for all of a sudden, the fact is people, he's having a lot of hard time trying to find people to work. And people don't, and they are like, the, the people who would have worked for him before, told him, uh, yeah, in our downtime, we might have moved that gravel for you, but you paying us to deliver some stuff, and now you want us to do what? Uh, we ain't doing all that. And by the way, you pay me more money. And so <laughs> things have changed. So I want to know, you know, just because whether you're on the decline or on the uphill slope, you know, there's still challenges, whether there's, you know, with even growth. So I'm just kind of wondering, what are you hearing from the variety of clients that you deal with? Oh, no, that's, you know, the workforce shortage, the, the great resignation, as it's being called, has been, um, it has just been unprecedented for small businesses. I mean, small businesses, you know, you got impacted by this pandemic, but now 
trying to find a workforce to be able to help you sustain. And even though you may now things are good, are much more back to being face to face, you have yeah. a lot more clients, you have a lot more things happening, new restaurants are opening, new things are opening, but trying to get people is so hard, but it, it's, it's just so interesting to see. And a lot of people are going, well, where are they going? What, what's happening? And you know, are they starting their, uh, their own businesses? You are seeing, you know, quite a few new businesses starting. You're seeing a lot of folks who are, you know, changing lifestyles. They're changing, you know, they pre-prioritize things. Do I really want to be working, doing this, 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 this for so long, making this much, or do I want to be doing this? Do I want to be following a passion? Do I want to be, you know, being more efficient with my time? And a lot of people are starting to, you know, realize that. And I think that, you know, one of the big things that we've been talking to is, and I, and I loved what Jesus said earlier, and I actually agree with him 100%. It's very hard to, for somebody who has not been in business, yeah, giving advice to people who are in business right. on how to sustain their businesses, right? Like I myself, having having been a previous business owner before, and a lot, m most of my staff having uh, had that opportunity to do that as well. I think it's so important, but you know, you don't fully, you don't fully appreciate the the complexities that come with um, not having certain things and not being able to do certain things in small business. And when it comes to workforce, if you don't have the workforce to sustain you, it's very, very challenging. And I will say that one of the great things about um, my staff here is having had that experience, that understanding of, you know, well, this is this is what you may want to consider. I mean, it's definitely something that they've looked at now we've looked at and we we work with our small business clients on how to maybe pivot how to okay. work through all of those kinds of issues um especially with regards to workforce because now you're seeing burnout that's that's one of yeah. the biggest mm. that's one of the biggest problems that's really going to start happening and that we're starting to see is a lot of these small business owners who are not able to have the capacity with work with a workforce they're starting to burn out and that is so dangerous for a small business to endure so it's critical that they understand how to adjust their business model or what they need to do to adjust because they need to take care of themselves as well, right? No, no one person right. can do it all. And I commend Jesus for everything that he's done. And so many entrepreneurs have done some very, very similar things and have gone months, years without, um, at this point, years, um, without actually taking a paycheck to sustain their employees. And But you also have to think, how, how do you do that? And, you know, I think that that's just one of the... Um, one of the more uh, dangerous aspects of this is, you know, making sure that you find the way through. And that's why I say to pivot your business model, understand a new business model, maybe enhance your mode of delivery. Like a lot of folks um, are now trying to find ways to be more efficient, automate things, streamline things. That's really where things are starting to move to. And this is where it comes back to, again, full circle innovation. How do you innovate in your small business or innovate in general to be able to make things a lot more streamlined to help take that burden and alleviate some of that stress? And also, you know, finding new ways of uh, creating revenue. What are some additional revenue streams that you can do that will help with that pivot, help with that change? that will maybe reduce the need for some of those key positions that you've lost in the in the model that you had. And that's where we have been seeing a lot of success with our clients and working with them to understand how to do that. And really, I mean, it it quite literally has saved a lot of businesses to do that because as you lose as you lose workforce, it's you're losing your ability to be able to do what it is that you've set out to do in your business. So, I think that Hopefully that kind of answers that question. No, yeah, that absolutely did help. Uh, thank you so much. And, and on that note, I, I got a question I want to bring in from uh, that came on online. But before I do that, I, I want to bring Jesus in just because you just mentioned him and 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 just doing my interview with him. Um, he talked about how he had to pivot like mad. Um, he went down with a lot of trucks and then he brought them back and now he's big time set up for growth. So I, I want to ask him about, you know, what does the next 18 months look like for you and your business? Hey, Suze. Uh Yeah, it looks great. Um, okay. we just, I just, so going through everything I went through and then rebounding and uh, building back my revenues and growing back to, again, we just hit 6 million, just on just under 6 million last year. It put me kind of back on the map. Um, by the time you came to see me, and we did an article in the um, Florida Times Union 
while doing the research on me, you realize you were like, wow, you're already on, you've been on the front page of every newspaper. So I'll tell you what that did for me. That gave me a high profile in my part of the country. And what that did was that brought a lot of private equity. And so I actually am in the process of securing my very first, I'm 100% owner of my company. I'm in the process of securing my first private equity deal. And it's going to allow me to probably, I'm going to triple revenues in the next 18 months. Um, right, and so right. we have a plan going forward. We just submitted all of our, all of our information and we have a plan going forward. And, and kind of, I was able to pick who I wanted to do business with. And that's kind of the message for me to small business owners is like, hey, you got to weather those storms. You got to make sure you're doing actual business. You got to keep your books in order. You got to make sure you understand uh, things from a, uh, an investor's perspective. But once you get to the promised land of showing positive cash flows and understanding what an EBITDA is, yeah. you now you every every when a bank doesn't want to talk to you, all the private equity guys do, and that's the actual money you want to try to go after because that's friendly money. That's the okay. money that doesn't come with a lot of strings attached. Yeah. And they will help you along with the expertise. Typically, when you get money from a bank, it doesn't come with expertise. You might blow that. When you get money okay. from private equity, they surround you with experts that will help you to 10x. And that's okay. the stage that I just hit. Well, that's congratulations. Uh, that's great news to hear. Uh, really wonderful news to hear. Um, I'm going to take a question that came in from the chat. And Dave, 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 I think this one might be fit you. It says uh, the service industry has been hit hard since the pandemic began, uh, especially restaurants. Um, what are they doing to attract and even keep workers? I, and before you even answer, even here locally, I was blown away when El Pollo Loco was having like all these incentives to just join them and all this money, targets paying all kind of money. I don't know. It's it, I'm, it's just what have you noticed in your world? Oh, yeah, I, I'm seeing the, the same thing as you are that um, Suzanne Boy just um, drove past a, a checkers restaurant, um, fast food restaurant the other day, and they had a sign out front $500 signing bonus to become Who was a, that? A, a member of their team there. So in those kind of things were unheard of 10 years ago when um, there were lots of um, people looking for work and were easily accepting the jobs without any bonuses to take them or anything like that. And, um, you know, in addition to um, increasing the base pay to $15 an hour, some um, local um, retailers and restaurant chains are offering health insurance to their employees, like um, which weren't, wasn't the case in the past. They're also offering um, more flexible work hours. So they're not um, assigning people to hours. They're asking people, what hours would you like to work? Wow. And also um, giving them um, more um, other fringe benefits, like maybe they might pay for their education if they're taking a a class at a community college, they might help them with their tuition and things like that. So um, restaurants and small retail stores and places like that are really trying to do a lot to incentivize getting people to um, apply to work for them. Well, on that, th thanks for that. But before I go to Nancy, uh, and Nancy, I want to I want to ask you about you know work life balance stuff. Uh, before we get out of here and all that. But I want to stay on you, Dave, for a second more and ask you about your world, about Amazon warehouses. They've been popping up, popping up all throughout Florida. And so I'm just kind of wondering, in what ways have they impacted local businesses? Oh, yeah, they, they have been a lot um, of the impact on the small business community where, um, as, as you know, um, there's been Amazon warehouses um, opening throughout Florida, just in our county, to our about to open um, within the next few months. And these are places that employ hundreds of workers. And in some sites, um, one in Tallahassee that's a, um, under construction will have a thousand employees just at one warehouse. So um, it's um, creating um, more difficulty for other um, companies to hire workers because a lot of people are attracted by the Amazon jobs. And these are both um, in the warehouse and also delivery drivers. And they're, um, they're running three shifts in a lot of these places. So a, a two um, income family where one per, where, that might have small children, one person could take a overnight shift and the other person could work a nine to five shift at another company. 
and then they would save on the childcare costs. So actually, they're besides having the true income, they're saving money by not having to um, hire childcare. And the Amazon is also um, attractive in, in some senses in their fringe benefit package. So they're um, they're kind of good for the public where they um, you know give you same day or next day delivery on just about anything. But they're also um, presenting challenges to small businesses by um, taking workers a way that other businesses might be able to attract. Wow. Thank you. Uh, before I go to you, Nancy, um, I do he, something you just mentioned, Dave, made me want to come back to Jesus for a hot second. Um, you know, you keep reading the headlines about the, the shortage with truck drivers um, nationwide. Do you have any comment on that and what's your experience been? Me? Yeah. Um, you the yeah. truck company? Yeah, you said something about Nancy. All right. So uh I said there it before is, I get back to Nancy. Go ahead. All right, stop yelling at me. <laughs> Go ahead. Y'all don't know. We do this all the time. We I make her text me at five in the morning because that's oh, the time geez. I respond to her. All right. So we do have a truck driving shortage in America. We have a driving shortage in America. Because kids don't want to drive. Kids are going to college without a driver's license. So how are you going to convince them to get a CDL? Part of the reason we have a shortage in America is because we're scaring them with automation. It is not the truth that automated trucks are going to chase them out of a job in five years. Automated trucks are already here. And yet we still have to retrofit the entire country with a system to support automated trucks. And that's going to take 40 years. So if you're 18 years old right now, and you go get a CDL. Oh, by the way, I three and a half, four weeks ago was in Tallahassee and helping steer the legislature. Remember, if you're in politics, business, you're in politics. I was uh, kind of educating the entire state legislature on why they need to uh, pass the Congress, help uh, lean on the, the law that Congress is passing to say that we need interstate, not intra. Currently, if you're 18, you can drive a truck. I see you can get a CDL for intra-state stuff in the state of Florida, but that you need to pass the the, the law that allows 18 to 20 year olds to go interstate between Florida and Georgia. Uh, one, it will uh, help solve the problem of of the C lack of CDL drivers we have because the average age of a CDL driver is now 54 to 57. Uh, but two, I was in the army for 20 years. We, at, we, everywhere we go in the, in the entire world, and we actually have PLSs, flatbeds, reefers, all of the stuff that we use in trucking, all of our 20, 18 to 20 year old kids are the ones that drive those trucks in combat, in Iraq, doing snatch and grab, doing everything we do in Iraq, under fire. And then you tell that same 19 year old kid who probably has two combat deployments under his belt, when he gets back home, he can't pick up a load in Jacksonville and deliver it in Savannah. <laughs> right. Wow. And you'll wonder why we're stifling the kids initiative. Wow. Of course, those kids can get a CDL and drive trucks. Now, uh, I got a CDL. Um, and so when you it takes about 30 days of actually full time schooling to get a CDL. And then you actually go from there. You actually go to your trucking company and you're actually in a truck with a trainer for about six to eight weeks learning how to be on a road. So that's for an, everybody else. Well, Congress, in addition to that, has placed an additional 400 hours of training for that population of people, 18 to 20 year olds, so that they can mitigate the risk of 18 to 20 year olds getting a CDL. So you get the 30 days of school, the six to eight weeks of training, and Congress levied an additional 400 hours of training for those people. But what typically happens is the... Um, the people that are in the room that can make the decisions are like, no, we shouldn't have 18 to 20 year olds uh, driving trucks. And what I'm telling them is like, no, you don't want your kids driving trucks. We're talking about poor people's kids because poor people's kids aren't on the internet or playing video games. They're outside, they're fixing cars, they're jumping fences and they're falling out of trees. Um, mm. and, and because they still work with their hands because I was a poor kid growing up, right? And those kids mm -hmm. are exactly the kind of kids that are gonna drive trucks and then by the time they're 21 year old, they're gonna own a truck, own a truck. And when they're 25 year olds, they're gonna own a fleet and they're gonna be trucking millionaires. And this is gonna open up a whole nother industry and a whole nother opportunity for entrepreneurs, for young people to see a path 
to the free market that currently in is, isn't available because everybody has to go to college, right? Let's no, open no up the path and show them the path to the American dream that doesn't involve college. No doubt. I love it. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, you know, we're actually, I have, first of all, I want to thank all of you guys because you guys have been wonderful and this has been so much fun. Um, it's my passion, but I want to go back to you, Nancy. I keep throwing your name out and not getting to you to a question. And before I have a wrap up for each of you, because I really want to know from each of you, what kind of advice would you give small businesses moving forward? Nancy, you know, you've been working with women owned businesses for a long time and you've helped them to access corporate and federal contracts. Um, but in the last couple of years, you've been, um, you witnessed a lot of struggle, you know, and, and a lot of triumph over the last couple of years. So I'm kind of wondering what's impressed you the most about resilience, innovation, creativity that you witnessed in these last uh, couple of years, you know, despite all these challenges. Right. Well, you know, it goes back to a lot that we've discussed already. Right. And, yeah. and the bottom line is people do business with people they know they like and they trust. And you can build relationships with your bankers. You can build relationships with potential investors. You can build relationships with uh, the legislature, right? So I, I belong to a, a really great organization called Women Impacting Public Policy. The okay. whole purpose of that organization is to um, bring forth to our US Congress the issues that affect women in business. So again, there are so many opportunities for us to learn and to, to, to grow, right? Um, and, and I think one of the, the best things that uh, small business owners can do um, is to retain their employees by showing you know, different levels of appreciation, right? Okay. Um, it, we all know that it's a lot easier to retain than to you know, train and bring on new employees. And there's uh, lots of information out there on, on how you can show appreciation to your em employees as a way to retain them. And the statistics show that people will stay with a company if they feel appreciated, even if they're not making as much money as they, as, as they um, want, right? Or feel that, that, that they deserve. So I, I think I'd just like everybody to, to, to think about um, all of the opportunities that the that the pandemic has has given us, right? And to to look at how can you be creative, um, you might have to do what 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 Jesus said he did is you, as a small business owner, you don't take a salary for a while, so you keep your employees on, right? Mm -hmm. um, what you can do also is really work on those relationships because you need those you need to have those in place before you need them. Right. So um, I have uh, I, I've learned a lot from this panel and, and I, I think this has been a really great discussion. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I love it all. Um, I think we're, we're actually close to an hour. It went by so fast. So I'm going to ask each of you, you know, if you don't like my question, give me your own ending. But here's my question. What kind of advice would you give small businesses going forward? Because this pandemic is still here. Yeah. Who wants to go? How about I can, Houston? Okay. I, can, I can go. <laughs> Let's go on first. Okay. So from, from an advice standpoint, you know, one of the, one of the biggest things is make, you have to make a plan. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to plan for certain things to happen, right? Who knew that COVID was going to happen? Who knew that, you know, there was going to be a huge work shortage. It's, it's almost impossible to make plans for everything. However, it is important to understand that you need to have a roadmap that can account for massive shifts in the operations of your business. Business continuity is such a big thing that you need to be prepared to address and understanding how best to navigate that, right? So really making a plan and also seeking advice um, from business professionals. You know, uh, I think that there are so many great resources out there to be able to leverage and really know that you have options to be able to talk to folks. I will say that the Small Business Development Center might be biased. You know, we have we yeah. have great folks who are able to, you know, jump in and really provide more one-on-one -on -one technical assistance because they're boots on the ground. They're, they're, a lot of these folks have been there. They know the struggles because they've been in them themselves. You know, like I said myself, having been a uh, an entrepreneur, having been a business owner, an, an employer, I know what 
I know some of those dynamics, but a lot of our staff know that too. And it's important to know that those resources are there and they're available for you. But also, you know, you have to look at what you can also do that doesn't just include going and speaking with a, a business professional or an advisor. It's adopt technology to assist to achieve your uh, efficiency a, a lot of times. Those are the types of things that you want to look at, look to what kind of tools, what kind of resources are there. And that's where, um, you, th you know, you could really make an impact on your own future for your business by doing that. Love it. Let, let me say we got less than four minutes, but I want to just take full credit for picking an awesome panel. Thank you all. Uh, let me just tip. That's all on me. All on me. <laughs> You guys. Anyway, okay. Anyone else? I need closing uh, statements. Who goes? Hey, Suze, what's up? All right. Uh, the pandemic is real. I'm not one of those that say the pandemic wasn't real. Um, yeah. Here's the thing. We have allowed this pandemic to change our personality as Americans. It's time to come back outside. I have had an ad up for $60,000 for about two months. I've done over 40 interviews and I still haven't been able to hire. And I'm going to tell you why. I don't have anywhere on my ad for remote work. And mm, the first question everybody's cool. asking me is, can I perform this remote? And mm -hmm. I didn't advertise it, can I perform it remote? Um, as a small business owner, there is a word we use in the army called operational awareness. It's about the conversation being had in the room that doesn't involve you. If I am talking to you some and somebody else needs to gain operational awareness about that subject, just because it doesn't involve you directly, we're all getting smart about it by being in the same room. You can't gain operational awareness about this subject from across town because you're and waiting for me to get on the Zoom. That is the lifeblood or the lifeline of a small business, not an established large uh, corporation that has a bunch of stove piped co uh, customers that you just got to execute this account. We're talking about a small business where everybody is everything. So we, so what I'm also seeing and what I'm also encouraging people is go apply for the job that you don't even qualify for, because oh. you're going to be able to skip a lot of people with all these cre uh, creative <laughs> resumes that want to sit at home on Zoom in their pajamas by just being able to come outside and be alpha. Go outside and go take somebody's job because you're ready to go join a team and be a part of something. That's actually what Americans do. It's time to go back outside. When I'm hearing all these companies that are just starting to go back to work, we're just starting to enter the office. You've allowed this thing to change your, your personality as an American. All right. And I'm okay with you being safe, but is it's time to go back outside and it is time to go get on somebody's team. And it's, tar it's time to stop just worrying about self, me, uh, Zoom, partnership, all these really ambiguous terms that really lead to the fact that you don't want to be on anybody's team. It's all about you. You want to be remote and you just want to make a bunch of money. Go get on somebody's team, go join somebody's force and go help somebody go create a really big thing. Cause it's actually hard to run a small business out here. Right. Yeah. And you've allowed yeah. this thing to change your personality. That's never been who we were as right. Americans. This time right. to go back outside. Love it. Thank you, Asus. Anyone else want to uh, give a closing statement? Because we got like a minute and a half, or actually a minute. <laughs> I'll mention um, one thing for um, advice for small business owners. I think um, some do it well and some don't. Is talk to your customers because okay. um, they, um, you know, you can find out what their dislikes and what their likes are about your product or your service. And some um, business owners are isolated in their offices and don't ever reach out to their um, customers to find out, you know, what's going well, what's not going well. So I think they could um, help themselves by, um, you know, getting out in the public with their customers and finding out how the business is going from their standpoint. That's perfect. Thanks, Dave. Um, we are out of time. I am so grateful for each and every one of you. This has been so much fun. And, you know, it's, it's my passion. I, I, and I love small business. Small business, small businesses hire more people than corporate America. They're more nimble. They make changes, but they got challenges and they need help. And I'm just, I'm just so grateful for each of you and your time. So I want to just say thanks again. First of all, audience, thanks for tuning in. And thanks for joining us today. Please join us on the next Florida Pulse.